Hello and welcome to Meeting Place. I'm Hugh McCollum. This week we're visiting Montreal with members of Shara Zion Congregation. Anniversaries are important in the life of any congregation, and Meeting Place is invited to a great many of them. I'm afraid we have to turn down most invitations, but every now and then we can accept, and they're always happy occasions. At today's service, the people have assembled with their rabbi, Morris Cohen, for a diamond jubilee, giving thanks for 60 years of service in their community. They'll be giving thanks especially for their Hebrew day school. They tell us that this pioneer effort is now widely recognized as one of the finest such schools in North America. So let's go to Montreal for anniversary worship with Shara Zion Congregation, led by Rabbi Morris Cohen. In a spirit of humility and reverence, and deeply conscious of the immortal continuity of Jewish life, we dedicate this building to the sacred memory of all synagogues in Europe destroyed by the rage and fury of Nazi hate and oppression. These words inscribed in bronze on a plaque in the main entrance of the Sharazan Synagogue in West Central Montreal commemorate the opening of this sanctuary on September 18, 1947. The congregation and our first permanent home were established in 1925, and we are about to enter our Diamond Jubilee year. We belong to the conservative movement in Judaism, which is distinguished by its commitment to tradition and its openness to change. Today, women in the conservative movement are especially gratified by their greater participation in all facets of synagogue life. We welcome the opportunity for young girls to celebrate a bat mitzvah, the equivalent of a boy's bar mitzvah, and most recently, the opportunity for women to train as rabbis at the Jewish Theological Seminary. The congregation is very proud of its role in the establishment and development of Hebrew education in Montreal. Although Sharazine always had its own school, and for many years a Hebrew high school, in 1951, it took the initiative to establish the first conservative day school in Canada, the Sharazine Academy. This evolved in 1969 into the present Solomon Schechter Academy, an independent school largely under the auspices of the Montreal Conservative Congregations. From 1920, when our first services were held in private homes, to the building of the sanctuary in 1947, we have kept pace with the growth of the city and we take pride in the contribution we have made to conservative Judaism in Montreal. Our congregation is made up of 750 families. Sharazan has been a leader in adult education, rendering a unique service to its members and the community at large with its enriching programs. Our own beloved Rabbi Maurice Cohen has played a central and dynamic role in all our endeavors, and particularly in the development of our Hebrew Day School and our adult education program. He has been with us for 38 years. We invite you now to join us in our Diamond Jubilee Thanksgiving service.
Congregation is seated. Our God and uh, God of our fathers, we are assembled before thee on this joyous day of anniversary and renewal with gratitude in our hearts and praise on our lips. We are thankful that thou didst give unto this community men of vision and faith whose zealous devotion to thee and to thy people nurtured this congregation and crowned its efforts with felicity. We are grateful for thy physical and spiritual gifts wherewith this house was built unto thee. 
We are thankful that thou hast been with us to this day and pray that thou mayest continue to abide in our midst for all time to come. Ashrei Yoshvei Veitecha, happy are they that dwell in thy house. We praise thee, Lord God, for our synagogue. Here we find solace and comfort in time of need. Here we celebrate our joy and gladness. Here we experience the beauty of holiness and strengthen our character with religious faith. Here we imbibe courage and inspiration to walk life's road with justice and morality. Here we come to Ghana learning and instruction. Here we gather to talk unto thee and hear thee talk unto us. Teach us, Lord God, that in rededicating our synagogue this day, we must first re-consecrate ourselves to thee. Cause the spirit within these walls to permeate our persons even when we are without. May thine eyes be open toward this house night and day. Let thy graciousness be upon us. Establish thou the work of our hands for us, yea, the work of our hands, establish thou it. Amen. We rise, dear friends, to memorialize the deceased members of our congregation. Adonai, 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 
Please be seated. In the prayer books on page two and the top of page four, page two and the top of page four, we all join in unison reading. Happy are those who dwell in thy house. They are ever praising thee. Happy the people that is so situated. Happy the people whose God is the Lord. A hymn of praise by David. I extol thee, my God, the King, and bless thy name forever and ever. Every day I bless thee and praise thy name forever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation to another praises thy works. They recount thy mighty acts. On the splendor of thy glorious majesty and on thy wondrous deeds I meditate. They speak of thy awe-inspiring might and I tell of thy greatness. They spread the fame of thy great goodness and sing of thy righteousness. Gracious and merciful is the Lord slow to anger and great kindness. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all his works. All thy works praise thee, O Lord, and thy faithful followers bless thee. They speak of thy glorious kingdom and talk of thy might to let men know thy mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of thy kingdom. Thy kingdom is a kingdom of all ages, and thy dominion is for all generations. The Lord upholds all who fall and raises all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look hopefully to thee, and thou givest them their food in due season. Thou openest thy hand and satisfiest every living thing with favor. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him sincerely. He fulfills the desire of those who revere him and hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he destroys. My mouth speaks the praise of the Lord. Hallelujah. Individually and silently, the Amida, page five through page 19.
שלום עלינו ועל כל ישראל וימרו אמן Will the congregation join with me in the responsive reading found on page three in the program brochure? O oh God and God of our fathers, do thou bless us as we gather here with grateful hearts to consecrate ourselves to thee. us, we pray thee, in years still before us, to show us the way and to guide us, O Lord. We thank thee for the tasks we shared together and for the hours we communed here with thee. for the will to strive and for the wisdom to accomplish, for hope when despondent and faith when in doubt. For all these we thank thee and praise thee, our Father. Thy house is our refuge, our buttress, our strength. We reverently pause to recall those departed who loyally served with heart and with hand. Oh, may we maintain and preserve what they builded and bring to fruition the seeds they have sown. to find here the truths that their forefathers cherished and make this their holy place, even as we. Amen. Accept then, O Lord, our heart's earnest devotion and keep us united in service to thee. We rise, dear friends, for prayer.
Almighty God, vouchsafe thy benedictions unto our Sovereign Lady, Queen Elizabeth II, and unto all the members of the royal family. Mayest thou in thy goodness and mercy preserve them in life and health, deliver them from all tribulation and hurt, and grant them a long and prosperous rule. Let thy blessings, O God, rest upon our country, Canada. Inspire the administrators of our government with moral wisdom and with an unflinching sense of righteousness that they may execute all affairs of state with justice and with equity. And upon us, we beseech thee, bestow well-being, happiness, and fruitful achievement. Shomer Yisrael, guardian of Israel, hear the prayer of this congregation for the land of Israel. Protect the young republic with thy divine vigilance. Mitigate its burdens, secure it from all danger and peril that it may flourish and go from strength to strength. Spread thy tabernacle of peace over thy holy land and its inhabitants. All this do we ask of thee, O God, in a spirit of humility. May it so be thy will. And let us say, Amen. Please be seated. Heavenly Father, grant peace, well-being, and blessing unto the world and unto thy people, Israel. Blessed art thou, O Lord, who blessest thy people, Israel, and mankind with peace. Sim Shalom.
It is uh, with much joy that I greet the congregation at uh, this inaugural of our 60th anniversary. And it gives us all in Shari Zion a great deal of pleasure to share our Thanksgiving service with our television viewers across Canada. 60 years of synagogue life the importance of this uh, central institution in Jewish life, the synagogue, I am sure, is not lost upon us. The synagogue, uh, wrote uh, Renan, uh, the French orientalist and uh, philosopher, has been the most original and fruitful creation of the Jewish people. Isaac Mayer Wise, one of the pioneers of Judaism on this continent, used to say Israel lives in its uh, congregations. To be sure, then, part and parcel of our celebration this afternoon is an appreciation of the impact which the synagogue institution has had upon Jewish history and civilization at large. And there is too, ladies and gentlemen, a strong personal and particularized component in our festivities this day. None knows this better than I, for I have been with you, been with you for nearly four of the six decades of our existence. Shari Zion speaks to us and touches upon our lives in a very personal and intimate and meaningful vein. 
But may I invite you now, dear friends, to focus on a singular message which I feel the synagogue has for us in our time and climate. I've called it a message, if you will. It's a kind of challenge, a challenge that summons us to reckon with the divine. Now, that's not easy to be able to reckon with the dimension of the divine. For whatever else the divine may be, there is this about it. It's intangible. It's unseen. And one of the hardest things for a person to do is to be touched by the intangible, to see the unseen. That was the foible of our ancestors in the wilderness, wasn't it, when they fashioned the golden calf? They couldn't accept an unseen God. They needed a tangible deity. And basically, that is what paganism is. The inability to see the invisible. And our sages have it. Ein kol dor vador, she'ein bo unkiya achat, mechet shel egel hazahav. There isn't a generation in history that is not tinged by an ounce of the sin of the golden calf. How goes the phrase, seeing is believing? That very much is the temper of our times, and that is the ounce of the pagan in us, an obeisance to the palpable, our obtuseness, to the intangible dimension in life. This, then, is the challenge wherewith the synagogue confronts us to eschew the limitations of paganism and to cultivate the ability to see the unseen, to see the unseen for one thing, here is a call to hone our regard for the past and not to overlook the yesterday that is out of sight. That is a pagan proclivity in us, out of sight, out of mind. Our civilization, dear friends, was not sprung overnight. Dare we be so contemporary? that we lose sight of the precious legacy of the invisible past. We need something more enduring than that kind of transiency to build a society rooted in the divine. The ability to discern the unseen. Well, here again is a warning not to be ensnared by the easy shallowness that pervades our culture and to insist instead upon internal integrity and realness. In a sense, dear friends, we are dealing here with the difference between character and personality. Personality is what we are, you know, on the outside, the mask that we don, the impression that we want to make, what we seem to be. Character, on the other hand, is what we are on the inside. That, to be sure, which is not showy or on parade, but what down deeply we really are. And so for ourselves, and for our children, for our public leaders, where do we place the emphasis on personality or on character? All hail the charismatic. 
But dear friends, we need something more substantial than that kind of superficiality to build a society that is genuine and divine. To see the unseen, above all, it must mean this for us, an awareness not only of what is, but of what can be. James Russell Lowell used to say, not failure, but low aim is the crime. Someone the other day, with reference to a sermon that I had given, chided me for my naivete in thinking that I could make the world over. Says a character in a modern book, who after his 25th year can possibly believe in utopia? The truth of the matter is that utopianism is not in nowadays. What's the title of Chad Walsh's precious little book, From Utopia to Nightmare? We no longer harbor great dreams for the morrow. We are no longer buoyed by heady and great expectations. The very change in the connotation of the word is so revealing, isn't it? Utopian used to be a praiseworthy epithet. Currently, the term is pejorative and is synonymous with the foolish and the fatuous. It's no compliment to be called utopian. It has uh, been vividly borne in upon us these last few weeks for all the affluence and technological superiority of our age, millions in our world, 1984, are starving to death. Let's not deceive ourselves. There are enough evils out there in the world. Hunger, famine, war, disease, poverty, racism, crime, terrorism, enough evils in the world to distill dreams of a noble fight. It is not because all is so well with the world that we do not spin utopias anymore. It is because we have despaired and surrendered our aspirations and pragmatic and practical people that we are. We are resigned to the futility of trying to create a paradise on earth. But that is precisely the function of the synagogue. If anything, dear friends, it is our dream house par excellence. Its chief aim is to nurture in all of us a stubborn and a persevering utopianism. The world outside our walls, to be sure, beckons us to, to sophistication and, and realism, but within our sanctuary precincts, we are fed to the fear of dreams. And idealism, can we succeed in our flights of nobility? I don't know. But if we cannot build a perfect world, we can at least make of it a better world. The challenge has been well put. You see things and you say, why? But I dream things that never were, and I say, why not? Ladies and gentlemen, we come into the house of God to see the unseen. In this spirit, may I ask the congregation to rise now and join with me in the Shehechianu in gratitude for participating in today's milestone. Together, 
Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Shehechianu Kimanu Vihigianu Lazman Hazel We turn to the adoration prayer on page 19. congregation is seated. Will the mourners please come forward? compassion, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all flesh. To thine all-wise care do we commit the souls of our dear ones who have departed from this earth. Comfort, we pray thee, those who mourn. Strengthen them in their sorrow and deepen their faith as they stand before thee now to magnify and sanctify thy holy name. In the words of the Kaddish, Yit Kadao Vit Kadash Me Raba, Bi Alma Divra Hirute, Bi Amlich Malchute, Vahayechonu Vimechonu Vahaye the whole Beit Israel, Bagalao Vizman Karib Vimru Amen, Yehesh Me Raba Mavarach Lelam Ome Almaya, Yit Barach Vish Tabach Vit Pua Vit Roman Vit Nase, Vitadar vitale vitalal shmeid kurisha brihu. Yeelam in kol birhata vishirata. Tushbahata venechamata. Damiran bialma vibru ame. Yehe shlama rabba mid shemaya. The chayim aleno vial kol Yisrael vibru ame. O se shalom vimumav. Uya se shalom. Aleinu v'al kol Yisrael v'imru amen. Mi sheshikein et shmo b'abayet hazeh, may he who caused his name to dwell in this house, hu yashkin b'neichem, may he cause to dwell among you ahava v'achava v'shalom v'reyut, love and brotherliness, Peace and friendship. Amen.
we've been sharing the worship of Shara Zion Congregation in Montreal as they gave thanks for 60 years of service in their community. And now for a look at some news. Bishop David Jenkins, the controversial head of the Church of England's Durham Diocese, has become involved in another verbal battle. He was consecrated in York Minster last summer. Two days later, the historic cathedral was struck by lightning and partially destroyed. Some said it was divine reaction to this blasphemous act. Clergy and laity openly protested his appointment to the third most prestigious diocese in Great Britain. Bishop Jenkins is an academic theologian who had openly expressed doubts about such basic doctrines as the virgin birth and the bodily resurrection of Christ. The new bishop used the occasion of his enthronement to blast Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and accused her of being indifferent to poverty and of wanting to defeat the striking coal miners. Thatcher was reportedly incensed and upset that Jenkins would use his enthronement service for what she called reaching for synthetic headlines. And the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Most Reverend Robert Runcie, publicly defended the new Bishop of Durham, but was reported to be privately perturbed at the controversy. Four nuns sent by Mother Teresa of Calcutta to help Winnipeg's poor and needy have established their order's first Canadian mission. Archbishop Adam Exner of Winnipeg said he wrote to Mother Teresa in 1982, asking her to send some of her nuns to the city. The four sisters of the Missionaries of Charity work from a home in the city's working class North End. The Archbishop said, we are really lucky to have them. Three of the nuns were born in India and one is from Texas. The Sisters' Mission, which will be visiting shut-ins and the elderly and teaching Bible studies, is expected to become a permanent fixture in Winnipeg. The Manitoba co-workers of Mother Teresa has about 250 members at the moment. And a spokesman said for the group, one of the things they will be starting immediately is walking the neighborhood at night and offering food and drink to anyone who is hungry. Everyone can listen to the preaching and contribute money to the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International, but only men can be members. Harry Shuttleworth, a public relations officer with the organization, told a conference recently in Edmonton that the religious group is devoted to spreading Christianity among businessmen and has 500 members in Northern Alberta chapters alone. All sexes, ages, and denominations can attend annual conferences, Shuttleworth said, but when it comes to policy decisions, it's men only. He added, we've had no controversy from the ladies. He said 125 to 150 women, mostly wives of members, attend the Alberta Chapters Conference and that the women contribute funding, sometimes in significant amounts. Mr. Shuttleworth said the organization was founded in 1954 by Dimas Shikarian, who had a vision of teaching Christianity to men. The vision did not include women, and the policy has stayed. Ruth Patrick, president of the Canadian Unitarian Council, said the fellowship's view is outdated and backward for modern religious concepts. Next week is the first Sunday of Advent, and we'll be going to Calgary, where we'll be attending a service at the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. I hope you can join us there.
CBC.